the actual um, the finale, if you like, serves as a sufficient um, introduction to this. So I'll just I'll read through this, which looks lengthy, but hopefully I'll make it quite quick, and then we'll get to some rather more interesting photographs. Um, so. Um, at Alfreton Nursery School, we entered the Rolls-Royce Schools Prize for Science and Technology because STEM learning and environmental education are two of the underlying values and principles of our school. Our project was based around environmental education, linking community cohesion and partnerships with business, along with mental health and well-being. Essentially, these areas of focus would come together to enable the construction and implementation of our outdoor STEM hive. This hive focuses children's education on the connection between the industrial and the natural worlds, maintaining a moral awareness of our guardianship over our planet. Unless we educate children about the dangers of excess, exploitation and abuse of the natural world, we'll never solve the big issues. But we'll, yeah, we'll never solve the big issues which will determine the ultimate survival or demise of our planet. Children are vulnerable to the short-sightedness of the adult world, as are animals and the natural world as a whole. We see our role as primary educators to provide children with a voice and to enhance their understanding of the symbiotic relationship they share with every leaf and every insect every second of every day. The experience of being involved in this project has been magical. So many people, young and old, have found fulfillment, well-being and learning. Covid put obstacles in the way, but we found ways around them. The community spirit that was at risk of being eroded through the pandemic was all the more precious as people came together to create our hive for all children and the beautiful planet we live on today and in the future. So that was our that, that was the way the project ended, if you like, uh, in terms of an evaluation of where we'd been and how we'd got to where we got to. But the actual hive itself is a massively important part of our curriculum now. It's huge in terms of uh, our timetable and the fact that all children get something um, individualized and inclusive from it. So basically this is in our car park. It was, it was, a, it was an empty piece of land that had some lovely trees on it, but ultimately it did nothing. Um, and it was, it was a change in, in view really to see that environment as a potential curriculum enhancement rather than just being somewhere that the children ran around while they were waiting to be let in at the start and end of days. So it became our outdoor classroom. So our STEM hive, we are nurturing future scientists, technicians, engineers and mathematicians of the future. Um, so as you come in, we've got our STEM hive. Everything in the STEM hive is either recycled, has been donated by community, uh, uh, different businesses or families around, around the way. Um, and because we were working with Rolls-Royce, we had to have a vehicle come transport focus within it. So a lot of the, uh, a lot of the metal work that is in there is, has been done using old chains and car parts and train parts and those sorts of things. So they've all been sculpted in different ways. So within the STEM Hive, we've got a lot of signage around which supports both teaching and learning in the sense of um, trying to help children to understand that nature got there first, if you like. So it's OK. We as as people, we have um, created amazing feats. We've got our, our aircraft off the ground. We know how to build bridges. We know how to build all sorts of different things, but actually we've taken that learning from nature because they did it first. So it's, as you go around the hive, you see lots of examples of the, um, the industrial world, but also how that links through to the natural world. Uh, and there's, there's not masses of text. We don't need all the text. It's purely about that visual imagery for the children to understand what they're looking at and how they can grow that. And then there are also um, information boards for parents and the community as they come in to see what they can do um, out there on, uh, during the weekends and their evenings with the children so that they can, they can extend that in their own way. So we've got lots of different areas of focus, including a science um, growth and decay section. So we will take for example, uh, um, around the Halloween point when we've got a lot of pumpkins floating around, we'll bring pumpkins in and we'll leave them to decay naturally in the space so the children can actually see that process. They can observe the insects that come in and take over and, and they're, they're watching growth and watching decay in real time. And then we also have a philosophy for children area where we get children to think critically, collaboratively, creatively and in a caring vein so that they are understanding the difference in views and to understand tolerance um, for, for the natural world as well as for people. 
we embrace seasonal change within the hive so that we make sure that we use it at all times of the year um, and we encourage the children to consciously a bit be aware of what is happening in that environment and how it is changing as the year progresses through. And we've got different spaces which encourage teaching and learning so um, on the on the on the left we've got our our eco hut which is basically where the children sit on crates um, and recycled wooden structures that we've, have been made for us by lots of different people. Uh, and that's where the lesson, if you like, often begins. And it's where we congregate initially when we go into the hive to have a conversation about the fact that we are visitors in the hive, but this is the home for a great many different animals. We talk about which animals may live here and the fact that as visitors, we need to show respect at all times. We don't use big voices. We don't run around. We, we respect it as the home for other creatures. And then the children from that point onwards will move on to different challenges, but also will move on to their own continuous child led play. Um, the TARDIS in the corner was donated to us by a family whose father died. He was heavily into uh, Doctor Who and he had this in his garden and he loved it dearly. And they just didn't know what to do with it when when it was a case of looking at the garden. So they came to us and said, you know, we can see you're developing your area. Is this of any use for you? So, so we use that for um, silhouette work light. Um, it's, it's amazing. You, we go in there, we've got all sorts of different twinkly lights in there. We've, we use torches and we use colour paddles and the children are making shadows. And it, yeah, it, it's a lovely space. There's, there's a rule that no more than three can be in at any one time, um, but it's, it's a very popular little space. Um, we have a music area, so we've got our wooden drum set, which is basically just five logs, but the children love it and they, they sort of do their thing. But we've also got Greta Thunberg there, who is our polar bear, um, and she takes care of a particular part of the site. So they're, used, they're making music and they're exploring sound with the saucepans and the, the metal trays, along with the wooden xylophones and the logs. Um, so again, you know, they're just and they're listening to the leaves, they're hearing the birds, they're clapping their hands, they're looking at how sound travels, they're doing a lot of scientific work, but using the natural world as their base. And then we had a parent who does body shop work for cars, uh, and he donated us some uh, amazing fronts of cars. So the children again are using um, recycled materials for their role play, but there is always this emphasis on where are you going in your car? Could you have walked there instead? I wonder what's gonna to happen to the planet now you've gone in that car and where are you going to go to in your car? So there is always an environmental edge to everything that we do in the STEM hive. So the children are contemplating what decisions they're making with that ethical uh, framework behind them. Again, some of the images in the, uh, in the, in the STEM hive look at how ants create bridges across rivers using their own bodies um, and we talk about this bridge making um, and then we've got lots and lots of natural resources and sometimes one of the challenges will be can you can you use anything that you can find in our stem hive to support you to make a bridge and how how are we going to manage that building how are we going to use the balance um, and can you work on your own but can you also collaborate with your with your teammates so it's the, the stem hive has been very specifically created to have lots and lots of natural materials just lying around, just in different spaces. And there's recycled guttering, there's old vacuum cleaner parts, there's, there's just stuff in different places, but always very respectfully stored so that the children can access it at any time without it damaging the environment. There's the, all the sensory play. So we have three um, we call them the pods. So we have three pods in the stem hive. One looks at global warming, one looks at deforestation and one looks at pollution. Um, and within those pods, we have these tough spot areas where we can explore different sensory um, experiences. So it, they, they do have a lovely time in all different weathers. Sometimes it will be ice, sometimes it will be water. Um, that's in the pollution area. So on that day, as much fun as we were having, we were also looking at chemicals in the water and what impact they, that may have on the ocean. And then there's Max there sat on Greta, um, who is just listening. His challenge was to see how many different sounds he could hear without making the sounds himself. Um, so he was just sitting there absorbing the natural world and just listening to the birds and the leaves. And of course, invariably, he said, oh, I can hear a car. I can hear an aeroplane. But the nice thing about that is obviously that then opens up a lot of conversation. All the maths play. Um, 
so we you know we, we go from the from the recycled tires and and the, the sort of the throwaway bricks through to wooden logs that have been um donated to to us by um, our local railway who were clearing a particular site. And then they said, would you, would you like any of these? Yes, please. We pretty much take anything anybody offers us. Um, but then equally where we know in the middle, we've got the, the, the giant spider toy and then the little ladybird. So from a mathematical point of view, just having a look to see who's the biggest, who's the smallest, what's, what's that all about? Is there actually a spider that big? Oh my goodness, there might well be. Uh, do you think a ladybird lives with that spider? It, to all the conversations that would come with that. The lovely science investigations that we do, as I say, with the pumpkins, it's getting our hands in there, actually feeling it, looking at it in real time. Uh, and there are lots of things just round and about in the environment. So there are little telescopes that are just on on the sides of the of the pods so children can use those at any time. And the magnifying glasses are sort of just floating around so children can can lead their own learning largely. Obviously, there's there's all the role play, and that's Eco Eddie, the the giant caterpillar. He's made out of hubs um, for cars and um, coils and all sorts of different things. But he's the guardian of the space, and often he has something with him. Um, it might be a box of sticks if we're going to be looking at deforestation. Uh, it might be a bucket full of plastic if we're looking at pollution. But Eco Eddie is, has usually got the trigger for the day's learning um, uh, underneath him, and the children obviously just rather love climbing on him. Or who, who wouldn't really? Uh, and then, as, uh, yeah, for, so that's the car parts from the inside, if you like, just sitting inside as they're going on their journeys and seeing where they might like like to end up. All the cross-curricular learning that comes with being in the STEM hive, though, you know, it's, it, it is science and maths and technology based, but invariably, certainly within an early years focus, everything links to everything else. So there's, there's so much going on at all times. And there is always that environmental thread. So there will be areas that have got a strong focus on um, helping children to think, talk, discuss, record all of their own thoughts about deforestation and pollution and um, and everything, all the other concepts that go around with that. And we know it's amazing because you, we know that historically um, we've got we've always had problems with trying to engage boys in writing in that STEM hive. I have no trouble at all. They are they're writing for purpose. They're right. They've, they've got their big movements. They're writing because they're engaged and because they're motivated by a particular topic or issue. Um, and it's it's mainly my boys that, do, that love to do all this recording. And these that what Oliver's drawing on there in the middle. We had a parent who she I think she sells bathrooms or something. I'm, I'm not sure. But basically she went to one of these shows and they have all these sample tiles and sample laminate flooring. And once the show was over, these were all heading towards the skip at the back of I think it was the NEC. Um, and she said, well, hold, hold on a minute. What's what's happening with all of those? And she brought me a carload of um, old samples and we've got them hanging up in the hive and they're lying on the top of the pallets and the children just use them as as canvases for their work. Uh, and it's it's really Really, really great. I think when once we alerted our community to what we were doing and got our parents um, looking as well, they started to see things with a very different mindset. And there they are making their volcanoes and looking at the impact of, um, of change within the earth. Deforestation. So this was an activity that we, we repeat quite regularly. So there's, there's the animals, there's the diggers, there's the sticks and the soil and the diggers are coming and what's going to happen and how we're going to protect the animals. Um, and the children get very, very engrossed in this and they've got all the little plant pots, they're trying to replant all the sticks to try to recreate the forest and then somebody comes along with a digger and they get really cross and frustrated and we have to sort of get in the way of that to some degree because they take it quite personally, but to tr it, it's a nice way of triggering those sorts of global um, discussions. They're very, very engaged, very with this. And we've got so many parents that are saying that they've learned so much since the children have been involved in this stuff that they just would never have thought of themselves. Uh, and there's lots and lots of time and opportunity for those quiet contemplative moments, but also those one to one moments where you can just sit and actually point out a tiny little detail to a child that you know will then have a big impact. So there's the use in the science uh, in, the, in the TARDIS. So that's our light and our sound going on um, and also in Greta's area there. Recording and communication, as I've said, very popular. And again, boys just 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 loving that. And that's all boys, actually. I hadn't realized. But yeah, because they are they're, they're in that every moment uh, and loving it. And even though we do 
print off pictures and laminate them so that they can be used within the weather. Those those images are two years old now and they're fine because they're they're looked after and they're brought out every every so often and therefore we, we can sort of justify that from a sustainability point of view. We do have adult led, obviously we have planting, we have um, lots of story sessions that then stimulate conversations about different concepts. Um, we do very specific global work. So we're talking about ecosystems globally. We're talking about um, the equator and why there are certain countries that are hotter than other countries. And uh, yeah, we, you know, so we, we don't shy away from anything. I know these children are only three and four, but there isn't anything that we wouldn't do in terms of exposing their, their, their thinking to a big concept, so long as we do it in a small and manageable way. Um, and yeah, they're, bless them, they are very, very involved and, and take part in everything with their, um, with 100% passion. So they collaborate all the time using all the recycled materials and the natural world that they're, they're within. Lots and lots of things are child led as well. So they, they, they just, they go off and they do their own thing as well as the stuff that we've sort of, the challenges that we set, if you like, at the beginning of a session. Bless her, Poppy. Ready. Um, and we've got an area that we worked with our local secondary school. They created a space um, for animal habitats and they built um, a really beautiful bug hotel with um, a lot of edible food around the exterior of that. So what we've actually decided to do based on that is we're creating at present I say allotment um, in small letters, really. It's basically a space where we, because I'm not, I don't have the time, the energy or the skill to create an allotment space. Um, I don't, wouldn't know where to start on, on that one. But what we are now going to do is we're going to have the big potato sacks. We're going to have... Um, the bean um the, the beans we're going to have lettuces growing we've got a cold frame we've got a little greenhouse so this smaller space within the stem hive is going to become where we grow um our food and also then we will say to the parents as they leave at the end of the day if you fancy in jackets tonight head over and get yourself some potatoes on your way home so the, the community will then be able to access that independently as the children grow it and harvest it they can then um access that and take that home to encourage that use of of homegrown for want of a better phrase um food but also obviously completely plant-based uh, and no nothing artificial within it uh, and the, the, you know primarily we're, we're looking at natural beauty so the children are operating within a space that is cared for and nurtured but not controlled so it is a very natural space but it is also a very very beautiful space and the train track that we've got running alongside again which is part of our discussion about transportation of food also about public transport versus getting in your car but then equally versus going on your bike but again there was another elderly gentleman who was massively into um his railway he had his model railway all the way around the full length of his garden from what i can understand and he died um, and again it was another moment where we were approached and said look we've got this railway we desperately don't want to just throw it away is there anything you can do with it so a volunteer from the community came and, and recreated a whole railway that is the full length of the stem hive on one side and the children just absolutely love it. But for us, it feels very much like it's we've got a legacy here. We've got we've got um, community embedded within that stem hive and all the well-being that goes with that and families who've given us things that are massively, massively important to them and that hold enormous value. Uh, and we are now embracing that and, and sort of teaching the children about respect for everything and the fact that it's all had another loving home but now it's with us and we need to care for it too and that is that so yeah that's I, I know uh, Peter wanted wanted me to just sort of share that so obviously any uh, oh, I don't know how to stop sharing any questions feel free but uh, it's a whistle stop tour of just a little part of our nursery that we've grown and that we do love dearly that's wonderful. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, I don't know if you'd be able to see the, the chat at the same time, but um, no. <laughs> uh, Diane was wanting to um, share that with her students. Oh, absolutely uh, not a problem. Yep, yeah, that's that's terrific. Thank you very much. And um, can I just open it to the floor? Has anyone got any, any questions on um, Paul Louise? No, but the outdoor spaces are absolutely amazing, Louise. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> 
<laughs> Eddie, the eco, the one that protects it, love it. Amazing. <laughs> Thanks. Can I just, I thought that was absolutely inspirational. Thank you so much um, for sharing that. Um, I love the way that you've also incorporated um, philosophy for children. Yes, it's a big part of what we do here. Yeah, I can, I can really see that um, just in the respectful, the way that you promote respect um, and the, the way that you care for the environment. And you can really see that underpinning come through. It's good to have something that also underpins you um your practice as well isn't it because sometimes yeah. people will say well what do you base everything on and it's sustainability but it's yeah. lovely to see the the ppc coming through so. yeah well without without that inquiry-based curriculum then yeah. you, what you're at risk of just putting your own view all the time aren't you you're yeah. just telling everybody what to think and how to think and actually it needs to be much more open-ended yeah. yeah thank you that was yeah thank you inspirational. and i would reiterate what diane says yes and i'd be very keen to share that with students no problem. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Lovely. Anyone else got anything they would like to ask or comment? Uh, hey, Amanda, you, you've actually provided a practical illustration of pretty much the conclusions that what I'm just about to say about STEM generally. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the nature of STEM and its implications for sustainability, but I think you're actually doing it in practice. You've got a very critical STEM perspective there. And there are some aspects of that that I really liked. Um, I really liked the nature got there first. <laughs> That's a great, great start point. Absolutely what they did. <laughs> yeah, she was definitely in there before us. Yeah. <laughs> John, um, you're, you're on next, so, so perhaps you'd like to continue. Okay, can I share some screen then as well? Um, try and make sure you can. Yeah, that looks like it's happening. Oops. Does that look um, all right? Yep. It does, but I think we missed your first slide. Do you want to go back? No, one? no, I don't think so. That, oh, that, that's fine. It's just behind this one. Uh -huh. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Um, you touched on, you mentioned the boys a few times, and one of the things that I'm going to come back to is, is gender on this um, topic. Um, but really what we're talking about with STEM is about careers and potential occupations mostly. And I think one of the things that we have to question is to what extent do we stereotype them ourselves and practitioners stereotype them ourselves. Um, I'm I think uh, anecdotally, um, I've often been called upon to talk about this. And I started my uh, working life as a, an electronics engineer. Uh, I trained in the 1960s, actually, as an electronics engineer. So uh, in those days, there were still radios and TVs with, with valves in them that lit up. And I was one of the first generation of engineers who was taught electronics with uh, transistors. So, um, I was ahead of the field and uh, it, it gave me a meteoric rise in, in the profession, actually. I was uh, at a very young age, um, well over the national average salary uh, with all the benefits that came with that. And then I was de-skilled. Um, electronics engineering and certainly the maintenance that I was doing um, on, at, the, at the end of that period on very large computer systems actually ended. Um, instead of having people like me who could fault find at a discrete component level, they brought in people that they trained for just a couple of months and they changed whole component assemblies and used diagnostics to uh, identify which assembly needed to be changed, which was repaired by machine. Um, and electronics has changed so dramatically over the years. Uh, it's a very good example of, of, of uh, STEM careers. And I'm quite startled by some of the illustrations that are given in STEM because um, as an engineer, I had to be good at communications. I had to be really good at communications. I had to be able to write. I had to be able to argue a case for um, the particular assembly, uh, parts of the equipment that I was responsible for not being the problem when they were a problem and um, 
and to make the case for funding and all kinds of things which don't fit the stereotype of an engineer very well at all. And I had to be creative. I had to, literacy was certainly one of the most key aspects of it, but the whole curriculum was really very, very relevant to engineering at that time. And I think it still is. We tend to stereotype these careers ourselves. Um, so it's not at all surprising that children do it as well. So when we think about what children uh, know about these occupations, we need to think about what the person does, what the occupation is actually engaged in, what work it is. And from a schema play perspective, of course, I'm gonna identify the schemes <laughs> that, that are fundamental to these occupations. But the question I want to ask and, and sort of think, get you to think about it in the beginning is, does the national curriculum or the areas of learning and development actually help in any way in this uh, area, in, in helping children to understand what these subjects are all about? And does STEM, uh, STEM was originally um, created as a concept in the USA uh, if you look at all the original justifications from it, uh, they come from industry and business. They're all about improving economic competitive uh, performance internationally. They're all about uh, improving defense, um, even, even writing about uh, how useful it is as a concept when, when you look at immigration uh, policies, for example. But all of that's been adopted by the DFE and it's being promoted quite strongly. And there's been a bit of a reaction against it. So we've got SHAPE, the Social Science, Humanities and Arts for People in the Economy, which has been created by the Arts Councils uh, as, as a, a, a way of encouraging more people to go into those areas of the, the curriculum as well. So it, there's a competi competition for resourcing. This is actually based on originally. But most of us, I think, are more concerned about it because of gender. And if you look at the two most gendered occupations in the UK at the moment, they're, they're the nursery nurses and assistants, 97.7% uh, um, is, is fem female. And vehicle technicians, mechanics and electricians, it's 99%. Uh, of, of, of that professional male. So these, these are the occupations that are strongest, most strongly gendered. And it's not surprising that children get the impression that these are men's and women's occupations, because that's the truth. <laughs> that's actually what's out there. That's what they see on a day-to-day -day basis. And we need to change that. We certainly need to change that. We need to change um, the way we portray the occupations, we need to make sure the storybooks and all that uh, reflect uh, non-traditional roles. We need to um, deal with the unconscious biases, the, the biases that encourage us to give boys boys toys and girls girls toys. And you know, we've all seen research and uh, in many TV programs that have targeted this. Uh, subject and mostly people are not aware that they're doing it when they do it so uh, you know that that sexism in early childhood education is something we need to confront that's not stem stem is something else isn't it um if we look at what children actually do get from these stereotypical jobs i mean this this particular survey was done by one poll very recently but it was there's a large one it's a thousand children and you can see they're quite polarised, the, the particular careers that they uh, see most appropriately to boys and girls. And they're not, um, they're not necessarily the ones that you would think of as being STEM professions, or certainly not the ones that are promoted at, at the school and the uh, university level as STEM subjects, the, the uh, laboratory science and the engineering, et cetera. Um, Quite often, they're, they're much more the things that the, the occupations that children see people engaged in that we need to focus on. So, I'm going to argue two things um, now I'm, uh, on the interests of sustainability, and all of those sustainable development goals I've listed there are very relevant to this subject, I think, in their different ways. 
What I want to argue is STEM's part of the problem. It's not part of the solution to any of this. And a sustainable curriculum needs to be integrated and transdisciplinary. You may not come across that word before. It's like interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary, but it's saying go beyond it. It's a, a word that was actually coined originally by Piaget in the 1970s, curiously. Um, but it's, it's about going beyond the subjects and actually creating knowledge that's uh, beyond all each one of them through combining them together. And UNESCO in their learning objectives for sustainable development, which uh, was five years in the, in, the, in the development, make this statement. What ESD requires is a shift from teaching to learning. It asks for an action oriented transformative, that's a key word here, pedagogy which supports self-directed learning, participation, collaboration, problem orientation, inter and transdisciplinary, and the linking of formal and informal education. That really is a transformation of our curriculum. Um, the reason that the October uh, DFE document on sustainability is not fit for purpose is because it suggests that sustainable development education can happen in the separate subject areas of the curriculum. It can't. <laughs> it can't because it has to go beyond that. It has to actually uh, uh, draw upon those subject areas, but actually take a very different perspective for it. And of course, that's also true of the areas of learning and development in the early years foundation stage, which don't make any sense from a learning perspective for the child. Children aren't aware of those subject areas, so why on earth would, would, um, would they be helpful in, in terms of curriculum either? If we just look at the, the uh, inequality aspect of this, um, what, what we've got here is a problem that most people see as, and there's lots and lots of research that shows, that boys tend to have a preference and a more confidence in STEM su subjects. Many boys are not motivated by literacy and language as well. That's also a very key problem that we have. They're both to do with occupational stereotypes. They're both to do with uh, attitudes just as much as capabilities. And they're both very strongly research evidence-based. Many girls have a preference and confidence in literacy and language and many girls are not motivated by STEM. Now the, usually what the, the solution that's prescribed for this is to encourage girls to do more STEM and boys to do more literacy and, and language. And I'd say that that line is supposed to be through the words, <laughs> but I've obviously missed there. I think that's completely wrong. What we need to do is actually take seriously the fact that they're motivated. The boys are motivated by STEM. Therefore, we should give them STEM, but we should give them STEM the way it is in the real world. We should give them STEM with language and literacy in it. And girls are really interested in language and literacy. What we should do is give them what they're motivated in, but give STEM in it <laughs> so that we're actually doing, we're actually drawing upon their, what they know and they do, and they're interested in. And, and that will solve the problem. That means STEM L2, language and literacy added to it, and not STEM at all. And one of the main reasons that this is so important for sustainability, I mean, that's just a practical issue. That's a practical argument. It won't work unless you do it that way as far as, far as education is concerned. But what the, in terms of sustainability, what we have are wicked problems. We have problems that don't have a single scientific explanation or solution for them. Even something as mund mundane as choosing your next car is a wicked problem. There are lots of contradictions in the decision making that you have to take. Um, it's, it's not straightforward. You can't go to one discipline, whether it be economics or um, engineering or whatever, and, and find a solution off the shelf you actually have to consider multiple issues, your use, the kinds of roads you've got, the energy source. The, there are so many different questions that um, it, it uh, defies single subject analysis, in fact. 
we need a more integrated curriculum for sustainability and not less integrated. We pulling subjects together and saying that they are somehow closely related to each other hasn't been established by anybody and also it's going in the wrong direction. That's, that's my argument. So what do we do? Um, encourage, oh, that's interesting, it works now. <laughs> <laughs> encourage more. One of the things we need to tell practitioners, I think, is that their stereotypes are wrong. So let's take the, the, the difference between girls and boys in STEM subjects. These are the grades in schools. It's a, a big meta-analysis. So many, many studies have been compiled to get these statistics. But what they show is that, um, generally speaking, girls are better at STEM than boys in school. They do better at every level. I think the most important thing that these, these distributions according to gender of STEM subjects is there's greater variation in STEM capability within each gender between boys than there is between boys and girls. And that's true of most uh, inequality issues, whether you're talking about racism, sexism, whatever. The variation within a group is greater than the variation between groups. We imagine it's greater than it really is. What, what, what these um, graphs show is that for the very most capable boys, they do do better at STEM than the girls. But overall, the average girl does better than boy, the average boy um, at the same time. And what, what seems to be happening is at the end, you know, the, the, what, what the industry wants are the most capable children to go into STEM careers, and they're missing out on the girls because they're choosing not to do it. And they're choosing not to do it because of all those stereotypes of the occupation. So they can't be such a good girl or woman if they take one of those careers. Other people will see them less gendered because they take those careers. And that's the disincentive. So what we should be doing is actually focusing on that. So it, the stereotype is actually in the subject itself, in the occupation itself. And that's, that's where the, the emphasis should, should actually lie, changing people's views of what an engineer actually does for a living. Because we're wrong. It isn't. It isn't a job that's just about mechanics or spatial capability. Um, one of the key things that's happened in, in my educational career that um, I think illustrates this so well is that we've dumped IT as a subject in schools. And we dumped IT in schools because it wasn't fit for purpose. Because a lot of the time, the children were actually in advance of the teachers in IT. The teachers couldn't keep up. Um, and partly because we were trying to teach them to operate IT, when what we really need is people who can invent IT uh, and develop new ITs. Um, one of the key things that's come out of that whole debate is the notion of computational thinking which actually goes beyond the technology to become um, uh, focusing on the abstraction, abstraction process itself, the thinking skills, which in early childhood, of course, is so obvious to us. We know that the skills, the thinking skills that children develop in language are applied to mathematics just as much as they are to language and to writing and reading and to um, basic arithmetic. They're, they're all the same. So if we focus on, on those general areas, the integration, then we'll actually have something which um, is, a, it is responding to children's educational needs and not to the needs of industry or uh, employment. But th this is a problem that has become apparent with IT. It's actually true of the whole curriculum. So as far as industry is concerned and the sustainable development of industry and jobs and the economy, it's in, it's in our interest to actually go beyond STEM to do that. The other reason is, of course, directly related to the three pillars of, of, of sustainability. We all, we all know that we need to make our decisions, our development decisions, based on not just the economic criteria, but also the environmental and the social 
cultural implications of development. And when this was first introduced, it was people were more concerned about the, the big policy decisions for housing and for road systems and transport for, for cities. And a lot of the bad decisions were made on purely economic grants. And we needed to get the professionals who were involved in environmental uh, uh, studies and in social cultural knowledge areas to actually come together and make decisions that would be more sustainable. And there were so many examples of large scale projects and they still exist of course, large scale projects, which unless we actually take an integrated subject perspective, we're going to keep getting them wrong. And as I said at the beginning, this, this is true at, at a, a personal consumption level, just as much as any, I gave the example of car, but when you buy a washing machine for the, for the nursery, you know, there are so many complicated uh, issues to actually address there that it's, it is a wicked problem. And when, when you're deciding on the toothbrushes, as um, Cheryl has, has actually talked about a couple of times in our meetings, there are fours and against every single solution. They're, they're, not, they're not straightforwardly decided by a particular perspective of a research. You need to actually integrate all the time, practically, to make all, the, all of these decisions. And what, where did those three pillars come from? They came from ecology. They came from a recognition that you need those three things for survival, not just for sustainability. And it's all about adaptation to our environment and to, our, to survive in our environment. And if every living organism requires those three criteria. Social cultural extends beyond, of course, the, the population to actually look at other species and our relationship with the, with the rest of the natural world. But the key area that uh, is common to all of these contexts is, is being economic. It's actually living within your means to actually think about what, what the biologists call the principle of least effort, that whether you're a plant or a, a single celled organism or a, a, a human being, you have to actually take into consideration all of the time. You have to account for your costs, sustain energy resources. So environment, social, cultural, they're not just policy imperatives that we use in sustainable development education. They're actually based on basic economic facts of evolution. But uh, if, we, if we ignore them, we're ignoring life. Um, the possibility for future life. And we need to teach children about wicked problems. We need to explain to children that there aren't a single, there isn't a single answer to nearly all the most important questions that we want to address. Um, it, we need to actually introduce them to not single subjects where there is a single answer for every question, but uh, a subject sustainability, which allows them to draw on different subject disciplines to come up with solutions that they can try out in different contexts. And that's a long way away from where we are right now, I think. Um, I hope um, I haven't been too theoretical in all of that, but um, I, I, I wanted to get across quite a lot in a short period of time. And I think STEM has been something that I felt um, from, for many years is much more of a problem for sustainability than it's any kind of solution to, for example, the gender um, issues within sustainability. So I'm going to end there and hopefully. Lo lovely, John. That's really, address some questions. Really fascinating. Thank you. I mean, I, for me, it tied in um, so well with the philosophy that we use a bit, which is um, Einstein said that, that you, you shouldn't train fish to climb trees. And, and it's a little bit like that with children. You know, if a child's particularly interested in one thing, then you have to use that, not to try and change them and make them do something that they're not interested in. So, um, you know, how, how we'd get more men into, into early years or how we'd get more girls into engineering, you need to come at it from, from a different angle, not from just trying to make them do it. <laughs> And I love the survival for the survival slide you had, but I think I'd add to that 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 it's not just survival for the next couple of months. 
its survival for the next 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, um, you know, to try and get out of that politician um, mindset of, you know, just until the next election survival, that's, that's not enough. Um, so, but, I, but I, I love the rest of the slide. I just thought perhaps we could just add a, add a bit of time scope on that one. I think the, the politicians uh, focus on the election is, yeah. is the biggest problem of all, in fact. Very damaging. Because, because that, that means they, they totally ignore the majority of their constituents who don't vote. Yeah, yeah, all right. Let, let me open the floor though to everybody else and stop um, monopolizing people. I'm sure you've got some questions for John and, and potentially about OMAP as well, which I see you put up on the, on the slide. Anyone got any questions, thoughts, comments? Oh, there's lots in the chat, John. Fascinating, thank you so much. Thank you, very interesting. Thank you, John, really interesting, thought-provoking. Um, Naomi's had to go. Um, but yeah, anyone else got any questions? Or, and I guess having seen that, I mean, we know this, this stuff, you know, um, or, or much of it um, in our hearts, if not with the science, you know, and the research that we've just seen from both presenters. I guess our, our issue is how do we carry that forward to try and get the DFE and the politicians to listen to this? Because we're, you know, we're, we're pretty sure about what we want now. Um, but I mean, I've just tried with the APPG um, to get them to take on sustainability for the next year. And I was outvoted. So they, they want to take on you know, um, pay and retention for nursery practitioners and, and areas like that. And I get that because obviously that is crucial. They don't seem to see that the link is is why we're in the position that we're in. You know, if we'd sorted out something about this gender inequality, we wouldn't be paying nursery nurses twelve grand and you know and, and uh, car mechanics twenty nine or bus drivers fifty or whatever because that would never have arisen. And it's it's how to uh, to turn that clock around. I'm finding really really challenging. So if anyone's got any ideas. Um, it looks like the APPG is not going to help us this year, even though the DFE have got a project on it. Um, so I, you know, I'm, I'm running out of what else can we do other than approach the DFE directly through that sustainability project that they've got on. Um, but even that seems to be really focused around schools. Um, you know, the whole draft statement was around schools um, and around adding an extra subject and being the best in the world at something. Um, very competitive angle when when we know sustainability is all about collaboration and support and engagement um, you know it's, it's quite the opposite of their of their whole line um, and and it's it was really focused around England being the best when actually Scotland and, and Wales are already ahead of England never mind the rest of the world which is mostly ahead of England too so um, we, we've really got an uphill battle on our on, you know on our plate so if anyone else has got any other ideas as to how we can uh, push this forward I'm you know, more than happy to, to do everything I possibly can. I think we, we just do it. Just do it, yeah. <laughs> just do it from the floor. Yes, I think you're right, like Louise is doing, let's just do it. Um, we're going to do that in top. So I think Leaf are well on the way with, with doing it there. And there are, there are others as well that are just doing it from the floor. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's really good advice. I have actually just taken a, a meeting from Nursery World for, they're organising a sustainability conference. Um, so I'm meeting with um, Liz Roberts um, virtually later today, um, and I will definitely come back to the group to see what we can do about um, getting, you know, slots for all of you to, to speak and to, to showcase what you're doing so that we can try and get that to the rest of the sector. Um, so, yeah, do it from the ground. Anyone else got anything that they would like to say? Ask John or in general, otherwise I'm just gonna close the meeting a tad, tad early today. That's okay. Okay, great. Um, and next month we're changing it round a little bit because we're gonna talk about how to measure where we are in sustainability. And I think measuring electricity is one thing and it's actually fairly straightforward, but how the heck do we measure our education, um, the sustainability of our education? So I'd be very interested to hear anyone's um, thoughts on that. Um, and I do think OMEP has, has definitely got something to say with, with their, their passport and their system, and we're, we're certainly looking at that. Um, but would anybody else like to present on how to measure sustainability? Without that, how can we say we've improved or we haven't improved? Um, 
but as we know, it can be very, very subjective rather than objective. So it's not without its challenges. It is a wicked problem, I believe. <laughs> Anyone else like to, I'm hoping John will speak. Um, and I'm hoping we can get Childbase to speak about how they've measured their sustainability using PlanetMark. Um, but would anybody else like to, um, to, to speak? Just please say, or you can email us and we can we'll arrange something. Oh, got some comments coming up on the, on the thing. How do you eliminate the disparity between both genders doing the same jobs, but earning different salaries? Well, that's actually illegal. Um, in England, but it's possibly not illegal in other countries, and, and that's picked up by the gender um, pay award surveys in this country, where you have to declare which staff earn what, um, doing what, but I think the smallest companies don't have to do that. Um, that also discourages girls from pursuing the so-called men-orientated careers because they're not compensated fairly. Yeah, that's very true, and we look at actors and actresses and tennis players and things like that are, are really beginning to highlight um, can, I, can I just yeah. say though, that, that you know what you're reifying in in the question is the occupation being gendered. Yes. So if if um if we didn't call an engineer an engineer, if if we if we actually presented the the task of engineering as something that involves social skills, um, literacy, um, you know the the, the wider curriculum. Yeah. then um, it wouldn't be an instrument that could be used to uh, promote men, which, which is what we're talking about. It's not about, it's not about putting women down. It's about promoting yeah. men in preference to women in, in yeah. uh, different occupations. Why, why, are, why are so many um, men head teachers in primary schools when the vast majority of staff are women? You know, that's, that's to do with men choosing men. Yeah. To do with, um, Patriarchy. Hmm. Excellent. Oh, Diane said she'd like to participate, or would you like to do a presentation, Diane, on how, how to measure sustainability? Um, whatever. When you've spoken to Liz, just come back to me and see what. Oh, what, in the what, conference. Right. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Not, not, not the next week. Okay, oh, no, yes, no, no. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll do. Okay. Anyone else got any other business they'd like to bring up for now? Oh, Kyla's got 10% of their staff are male, and that's great. And that's well, much higher than the national. I mean, it's higher than us. I think we're on 7%. But as we know, nationally, it's only about 2%. You can get some nurseries that are entirely female. So, um, so when, where you are getting 10%, that's definitely something to shout about. But it's still a long way off 50, isn't it? Okay, anybody else? Okay, lovely. We'll see you all in our next meeting. And thank you very much for attending and we'll put all this on together. Thank, thank you. you. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. See you. Bye.